thank you, Tom, Alice. Thank, uh, thanks to all of you for being here this morning and joining us uh, wherever, wherever you are right now. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to uh, to be able to talk to you. Um, I want to start with a very several basic questions and then focus in a little more on emotions. So the first question I would like to ask is, um, do we, can we understand protest and politics without uh, using a cultural approach? Um, the answer is hidden in the question, of course. Um, and it seems to me that we've gone through some long cycles of theories of protest uh, going back 2,500 years, really. But uh, for a long time, protest was considered a form of madness, a kind of mob mentality. Uh, people were overly emotional. People went crazy in crowds. Um, they, uh, they might or might not have valid grievances, uh, but when you put them in crowds with other people, especially with a leader, a demagogue, an orator, uh, they began to do things that uh, normal people wouldn't do, that they would not do in normal life. So uh, this is a view that to some extent is still with us, but it was, I would say, the dominant view of protest through the 1950s um, or 1960s. At that point, as I'm sure you all know, more, more uh, structural views, more organizational views, theories that uh, saw people as rational rather than crazy, uh, these kinds of theories began to take over the field of social movements and protest. Uh, the central figure probably in the United States at least was Charles Tilley. Um, so he, uh, he was responding to theories in the 1950s that um, along, emerged alongside crowd theories that we could call grievance theories that if somebody, if individuals, wherever they were, began to be upset about something, they would automatically form protest movements, revolutions, and so on. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't a very good cultural language for understanding these grievances. So the grievances were measured by economic hardship. Uh, grain, the price of grain, um, lost wages, those kinds of economic measures were taken to stand in uh, for, for grievances. So there wasn't a very good sense of the cultural processes by which grievances get constructed um, around all sorts of, of uh, goals and, and social problems. Um, so in fact, it was very easy then for Tilly and others to come in and show that there really was no correlation between economic situations, economic problems, and social movement mobilization. So for them, this showed that in fact, protest was really about politics. It was linked to opportunities uh, such as elections or revolutions, other times in which people could mobilize to pursue their interests. It did not require a lot of cultural work uh, or emotional work to, to do that. So at the time, the, the main way that people who cared about uh, symbols and meanings and culture, the main tools they had really came from psychoanalysis, which sees these as um, coming out of our internal psychic dynamics. We're struggling with between the three parts of the brain that Freud famously talked about. And uh, these issue forth in emotions and symbols. Um, it was before the big cultural turn in social science and it was not a very good way to understand meanings. So in a way it's understandable that the structuralists who came along, whether it was Tilly or Sidney Tarot, uh, even to some extent Turenne in Europe and France, um, and others uh, really went out and looked for broader social structural 
groundings, beginnings of social movements. Um, it was a very non-cultural perspective. It was a, um, a perspective that um, looked for large historical shifts, modernization, it, it grew out of modernization theory, in fact, um, shifts then later from industrial society to post-industrial society, which were important to Turin. Uh, but it was all grounded in large demographic, um, economic, and political institutions. Um, now, so, so culture, is important because culture um, shows why people do what they do. It, it's possible to have a coherent structural theory. A structural theory would uh, not allow people to have any serious choices in what they do, uh, no real choices among options. Their actions would follow automatically from their position in a social structure or an economic structure. In other words, constraints were fairly, are fairly overwhelming in true structural models. Um, perhaps in, in the Tilly model, state repression is strong, automatic, and overwhelming. Uh, so that even if people wanted to protest, they would be too afraid to protest, they wouldn't. Notice I've used the word afraid as an emotion. Uh, Tilly didn't really talk about fear as a, as a mechanism that kept people, for, uh, that prevented people from protesting. Uh, but there are, there are always emotions in even the most structural models hidden there that we can later come back and, and take a look at. Um, structural, structural theories require some kind of rational choice theory, that if you are in this structural position, you understand your interests in that position and you pursue those interests. There's not a lot of um, flexibility in what your goals will be and what you will want out of life, in what you will be outraged and angry about that would make you protest. Uh, structural models almost always require that you follow your interests in a rational way. Okay, so they were theories of structure. They were not theories of action. And if we believe that there is such a thing as action, then we need some sense of the subjective, some sense of meaning, some sense of what the world means to people, why they care about the world. Um, so culture, as it was rediscovered in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, went through a series of uh, fashionable uh, concepts, the carriers of meaning, carriers of culture, uh, starting, I guess, with frames and frame analysis, but also including schemas, worldviews, uh, collective identities became very important in the 1990s for understanding why people would care enough to form social movements. Uh, later narratives were seen as the great carrier of understanding of, of cultural meanings, um, how we put things together into stories. Uh, decisions, strategy, were also, in my view, a part of the, the cultural turn, the cultural emergence. Strategy became something uh, that people grappled with, that they, they had to, they experienced, they struggled with. Uh, strategy was not a simple, it was no longer as it had been before, a simple, obvious choice. Well, this is what you do to get, uh, to take advantage of this political opportunity. So. Um, strategy and decisions are very much a part of culture. All right. um, the, the second thing I want to say then is if we, if we think that culture matters, if we care about action, then the only way to understand culture and action is to understand emotions. Emotions are crucial, crucial to culture. And I, I want to explain why this is. Uh, we talk a lot about the lived experience of people in the social movements we study, 
We talk a lot about interpretation. We talk about interpretation, uh, both our interpretation of what they're doing as analysts, but also their own interpretation of what they're doing, their interpretation of the world around them, how they derive meanings from the world. Well, I wanna point out something about the nature of meaning. Cultural sociology, culture, cultural theory in general uh, says, well, culture is meaning. Culture is something about how we make sense of the world. Um, and the word meaning comes up again and again. But after 30 years of the cultural turn, the cultural revolution, whatever you want to call it, we still don't understand meaning very well. Uh, we don't understand why one frame resonates with people and another frame falls flat. Um, and it seems to me we have a mistaken view of meaning, uh, that cu the cultural turn by leaving out emotions um, doesn't, can't quite animate uh, action, quite, can't quite animate those meanings and put them to work in people's lives, in people's actions. And I think this boils down to the fact that, um, and uh, I'll just stick with the English word, um, the word meaning has two very different meanings. On the one hand, a meaning is something like you would find in a dictionary. If I look up the word cat in a dictionary, I see something about four legs, a tail, fur, something that makes um, the word intelligible to me as though I were translating it from one language to another and you can point to a cat. That's the most narrow um, denotative uh, meaning of, uh, or meaning of meaning, what you would find. And you can see that a cat is different from a dog, it's different from a panther and so on. But that isn't a very interesting way of thinking about meaning. Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't make words matter to us. It doesn't make culture matter to us. In fact, there's another sense of meaning, which is that a cat means something to me in that it's re relevant to my life. I care about it. I have emotions about it. So when I see the word cat, it's not like a computer going cat. It's not dog. It's not a tiger. Um, I think about the cats I've had as pets. I might have a cat at home that I think about. I either like cats or I might dislike cats. I might be afraid of cats. I have all sorts of feelings about the word cat and the concept of a cat that make it matter to me in different ways. Um, now it's easy uh, to dismiss cat as a silly example, but if I, we, we, we instead think about groups of people or individuals or politicians uh, or nations uh, or God, and we, we substitute concepts like that in there, I think it becomes easier to see uh, the two different meanings. I can understand what God means in the dictionary, sort of, uh, but God does not mean anything to me personally. Uh, I don't have that kind of sense of awe that uh, the faithful have, for example. So the second set of, the second meaning of meanings really has to do, has to do with emotions, about our feelings, our orientation toward the world, how we are committed, uh, things that we like, we feel comfortable with, uh, things that we hate, things, people, places, ideas, and so on, and our feelings about them. And it seems to me that is really crucial to understanding why culture matters in action. It matters because uh, we deal with things that mean something to us. And this is true, um, for example, in strategy. Again, I said that strategy is now is part of culture. It can be understood culturally. Well, uh, when we're making decisions as, as political actors, as political players, uh, we have a sense, we have feelings about our choices. We face dilemmas, strategic dilemmas. We go this way. Uh, there are all sorts of attractions of that tactic, uh, but there are all sorts of risks 
as well. We have some fears. If we do this, we might alienate some other group. We might alienate some allies, even as we strengthen our bonds with, uh, with these people over here. Um, so all of our tactics have um, uh, an emotional aspect to them. We, uh, we, are, we, set, we balance, we sense these dilemmas, but we also feel certain ways about tactics themselves. We, we feel good about perhaps nonviolent tactics. Other people might feel good about riots and more, more aggressive tactics. Uh, we, have, we have a sense of, their, of, of um, their goodness. We have a sense of how exciting they are. We have a sense of whether they will feel, uh, whether they will fill us with joy. So there are all sorts of emotional attachments we have to, to the different things that we do as protesters and other political players. Let me, let me take a, um, a couple minutes to give you an example um, of what I call public characters. Uh, and I do this because this is a book I, I, I published a couple of years ago, excuse me. So public characters are uh, familiar types for us. They are heroes, villains, victims, and a stranger category of minions. So if you think of a two by two cell, you have uh, strong and weak, good and bad. So heroes are strong and good. Villains are bad and, but also strong. Victims are weak, but good. Minions are uh, weak, uh, but bad, malevolent. So um, these public characters to me are very interesting because they are why we care about narratives but they are also important to the reputations of political players, whether it's individuals or groups, political parties, social movements, they have reputations that involve whether they're strong or weak, whether they're good or bad. So a lot of work, a lot of cultural work goes into uh, what I call character work, making characters. We, we try to construct our own character, but we also try to construct the character of perhaps victims whom we're trying to save or villains who are our opponents. Um, so these characters are show very clearly how we cannot avoid emotions in culture. Because part of the definition of each of these characters has emotions built into it. Uh, Heroes are not just strong and good, but heroes are people we admire. Uh, they're people we turn to when we are afraid and we, we rely on them, we depend on heroes. That's part of the very definition of a hero. With villains, we're afraid of villains, we, we hate them, uh, we, uh, we we may be amused by them or other things, but our essential, the essential definition of a villain is someone who scares us and threatens us. And that's an emotional dynamic. Uh, victims, we, uh, we pity. We pity victims. We feel sorry for them. We want to help them or think that somebody should help them, uh, but it's our emotional compassion for them, our sympathy for them that really defines them as victims. Uh, to, to fill out the fourth category, uh, minions are people we laugh at. Uh, we find them ridiculous and silly. And um, they're only dangerous when you put a lot of them together and they find a villain to lead them. Uh, they are helpers to the villain and then they can become dangerous. Uh, the movie with the little yellow uh, minions uh, actually captures the dynamic very well if you've if you've seen that. All right, um, let me go on to uh, a few ways that uh, emotions operate in politics and actually in social life more generally. Um, I uh, I'm going to draw here on the the book that Alice kindly mentioned, 
uh, the emotions of politics, uh, the emotions of protest. Um, so there are very different kinds of emotions. And we have a very quick, short run uh, reflex or reactive emotions, uh, like when we're startled or we're suddenly afraid of something that happens, a loud noise or somebody coming at us, a police line coming at us, say. Um, and those are the kinds of emotions, these reflex emotions are the kinds that have been taken as typical of emotions. They, we react very quickly and sometimes wrongly, mistakenly in the face of, or in, in the process of feeling uh, fear, uh, and anger is another good example. Anger uh, makes us do things in the moment that we later may regret. So that's one set of emotions is these very short run, short lived emotions. There are sort of middle range emotions that are typically called moods. Uh, they don't, they're not about something directly, but we feel in a good mood or a bad mood Basically, uh, when we feel in a good mood, we get energy. We want to go off and join the protest. We'll, we'll go out and do things. We're, we're, we're just more active. When we're in a bad mood, we feel resigned. We feel depressed, sad, and that's de-energizing. So moods, because they're sort of medium term, we can be put in one mood in this setting, and we can go off somewhere else and carry that mood with us and be depressed for days, for example, if something bad happens. Uh, they're not uh, too important in politics other than through energizing and de-energizing our actions. And uh, you know, that, that can be very important, actually. The most, to me, the most interesting sets of emotions are two kinds of long-run emotions. Um, so first of all, we have uh, feelings toward people, places, things, um, ideas. Uh, these are um, sort of long run orientations to, our, to the world around us. They are what provide our goals. We wanna protect certain groups or defend certain groups. We want to get revenge on other people. Uh, we are outraged or we are contemptuous, perhaps. Uh, and uh, that's, the, that's the dynamic of a caste system, that people in higher castes are supposed to be contemptuous of people in lower castes. That's what keeps them in, in, in their lower status. Um, so these are sort of affective uh, commitments, loyalties, maybe, to the, to the world. They are the source of collective identities, which uh, as everyone who studies social movements knows are, are very important. The second kind of long run commitment are uh, moral emotions. Uh, these include pride and shame. We're proud of ourselves when we do the right thing. We're ashamed of ourselves when we do the wrong thing. Uh, they include compassion, we might have compassion for certain people and not for others. We might have compassion for certain species and not for others. Um, it includes indignation, which I'll, I'll come back and talk about in a minute because it's a, it's a very central emotion in, in protest. Um, but all of these emotions, um, basically I would say are morality. So if you think about what morality is, it's tempting to think, well, there are principles of morality, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or from each according to his ability to produce, and these sort of um, bumper sticker kinds of principles that we've been taught uh, at young ages. And that is, these principles are part of morality, but they're a very idealistic form of morality and they don't enter into our daily lives or our political actions much at all, I would say. Um, they, they may shape in the background things that we do, but for the most part, uh, 
what we do of a moral sort has to do with emotions, what makes us feel good, what makes us feel bad, um, what makes us um, anticipate feeling good and bad. So I'll do the right thing if I anticipate that I'm going to feel ashamed later if I don't do it. Uh, sorry, Paula, that may be hard to translate. Um, uh, I anticipate the pride that I will feel when I do the right thing. I, I, I go to a protest at some cost. Uh, I suffer a little bit out in the weather, uh, but I'm very proud of myself later for having gone. Sometimes these emotions are not really explicit. I'm, I'm, I'm not conscious of them, but I'm drawn to a rally or a march because I do anticipate that I will feel good. So it's a funny thing about emotions. We Older visions of emotions had it that they kind of take over what take us over uh, and they compel us to do something or to act in some way. And in psychoanalysis, emotions were um, ways in which we managed our internal selves. And so we would end up trying to um, resolve an Oedipal complex by attaching ourselves to a movement or by hating the state and all these things that made emotions look you know, kind of pretty irrational. But emotions in fact are ways in which we manage our relations with the world. Uh, and they are reactions to our engagements with the world. So for example, I know perfectly well, or I expect that if I go to a rally, I will feel uh, anger toward our targets, toward uh, the objects of, of our protest. I know that I will feel or I expect to feel good about my fellow protesters and I will feel good about myself. So I put myself in situations knowing that I will have certain emotions, uh, certain feelings because I'm in that setting. So the emotions are real. I, I really do have these feelings, but I have helped manipulate myself into being in a place where I feel those emotions, right? It's not arbitrary. They don't suddenly come out of me or down from, from the heavens and take over me. I know what I'm doing emotionally. So a lot of politics is a little bit like reading a novel or listening to music. You pick a song to listen to and you know that it's gonna make you feel a little sad, a little nostalgic, or you know that it's gonna jazz you up, it's gonna energize you. And that's why you pick that music. Well, you pick a lot of activities in your daily life uh, with expectations that you'll have certain feelings as a result. It's not just, it's not just the arts. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about indignation then. Um, because I think where we are in understanding emotions is um, the social sciences have a very good, very elaborate vocabulary for understanding emotions. Normal people actually have a pretty good, uh, some of them, pretty good vocabulary. We can distinguish a hundred different feelings fairly accurately. Um, and so we have both a lay language and a sociological, psychological language for talking about emotions. So I think it's time that we went past um, generalities, abstractions. You know, we can talk about uh, the emotional community, or we can talk about emotional habitus um, and different things like that. We can talk about emotionality or affect. These are all quite vague terms. They may have their uses, but it's much more useful, I think, to, to talk about anger, to talk about fear, anxiety, to talk about the feelings of revenge, to talk about the feelings of contempt or shame. So let me talk for just a minute about the feeling of indignation, because indignation is a form of anger with a kind of moral cast, moral tone, to it that I think is what social movements really try to construct in their, in, their, in their construction of a social problem 
and a solution to that problem. So indignation is part of what I call a moral battery where you have, you're really angry about something negative, but you also have some vision of, some, of a better uh, alternative, a better future. So it's the two of them together that push people from the negative end, pull them toward the positive end. And indignation and hope are a co very common pair in protest. Um, so um, indignation uh, usually involves, um, usually starts with a victim. Something bad has happened to this person or these people. It usually has a villain. Someone has done something to the victim. And ideally it has a hero, the people who are gonna set things right, the people who are gonna come in and get vengeance, who are going to stop the torture, stop the, the threat, stop whatever bad thing has been identified. So indignation is built around these public characters that way. Um, and I think it's in a very, it's often very vividly constructed. So let me take a minute to compare two social movements or two mobilizations of recent years. Uh, the, the Black Lives Matter mobilizations and especially those uh, after the George Floyd murder. And on the other hand, uh, climate crisis activism. With George Floyd, the reason I think that more people got out into the streets than ever before over racial justice issues in the US and beyond the US was you had a very clear villain. Derek Chauvin uh, was impassive. He wasn't, didn't seem upset. He didn't seem to have lost it, as we would say. He seemed very concerted, intentional as he was was choking, um, choking Floyd. Uh, you have a, a pretty sympathetic victim, despite efforts by uh, the, by the uh, defense to portray him as dangerous and on drugs. He was in fact uh, pretty quickly reduced to a child crying for his mother. Uh, in the video, he's very passive. He's um, lying face down. He's um, there's a very clear. Uh, relationship between the victim uh, on the, the victim on the bottom and the villain on the top who has total control over the victim. And so you see juxtaposed the action that um, that defines both of them, the, the, the killing of George Floyd. There are other aspects I could go into, um, but I want to want to get on with other things. Uh, compare this to the climate change. Uh, to, to climate change activism. And with climate change, with global warming, pollution, uh, you don't have that clear juxtaposition. You have uh, things that happen, pollution, um, use of various kinds of carbon uh, that happen all around the world. The victims are usually separated. They're usually later, they're usually somewhere else. Uh, you don't have this very close proximity that you get with George Floyd. Um, uh, you, we also tend to think of the, the, the results of, globe, of climate change um, in terms that sound ancient, that sound uh, biblical in the Judeo-Christian tradition, um, floods, fires, locusts, all of these things that have happened forever. And we used to think of them as acts of God or acts of nature. Uh, and so it's off, sometimes harder to reconfigure them and find a human villain to blame, but that's absolutely crucial for, um, for mobilizing large numbers of people, or at least it, it certainly helps. Um, so we have here, we see the public characters, we see the construction of indignation in them, and we see uh, visual imagery 
which is uh, an absolutely crucial thing for constructing a lot of these uh, emotional characters, excuse me. All right, um, let me say one more thing about what emotions are. And um, in, the, in the sort of cultural construction tradition, there is a lot of emphasis on the words for emotions. So the, the word anger um, has certain bodily correlations. Um, different cultures have somewhat different words for different emotions. And so for a long time, it was thought that, well, um, uh, different cultures really have different emotions. People feel different things in different cultures. I'm not sure that's really true. Um, they just might have different words for it. In, because in fact, a word, a label for an emotion or the concept of emotion refers to a bunch of different things that are going on in our bodies. I call them feeling thinking processes. There are hundreds of things going on in our body at any given time. Uh, there are neurotransmitters that are going out through our nervous system or especially in our brains. Uh, we are holding our muscles in certain ways, uh, especially the muscles of the face might have different expressions depending on how we're feeling. Uh, we are taking in perceptions from the world around us. Uh, I am aware of my wife upstairs making a little noise and I'm beginning to worry that she's gonna come down here and make more noise. Um, there are, I hear things outside when we're at a protest, we're sort of aware of all of these other people, uh, around and what, how they are feeling. Uh, we get some contagion of emotions from them. If they're shouting and feeling happy, we tend to shout a little louder and feel happy. So, um, an emotion is a kind of bundle of these feeling thinking processes and, um, there's no one single perfect platonic type of an emotion. We can't, uh, we've been unable to go inside the brain and find this circuit and say, well, that is anger, or this is fear in this part of the brain. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of several different things. And when we uh, decide, oh, look, I must be angry, that label becomes another feeling thinking process that goes back and maybe rearranges, maybe has some impact on the other things that we're feeling. So there's this constant feedback interaction between all of these things going on in our bodies. So that instead of a cultural constructionist approach to emotions, we can really have more of a biological cultural uh, a constructionist approach and re really look at all, how all of these things, some of them cultural labels, some of the, most of them physiological processes, how they interact uh, to form emotions, combinations of emotions, sequences of emotions and, and so on. You know, that's a, 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 a not obvious and a little complicated. And again, apologies to Paola uh, for trying to translate that. Uh, let me, in the, in the last uh, 15 minutes or so, let me uh, address a question that comes up a lot in, uh, in the study of emotions and protest or emotions in politics, which is, are emotions hard to study? Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, we can, we can gather data on uh, media coverage uh, and so on. Um, of, of protest. We can gather data on all sorts of things. Um, but how do, you get, how do you gather data on emotions? Well, um, yeah, emotions are hard to study, but they're no harder to study than anything else we study. And in fact, uh, emotions have a reality to them that is much uh, stronger, much more visible, much more observable than most of what we study in the study of social movements. We talk about political opportunity structures, which no one has ever seen. Uh, we talk about uh, fields of protest, which again, no one has ever seen. They uh, exist in a, 
our minds as analysts. Um, we can talk about uh, any of the cultural stuff that we could talk about has the same problems and the same challenges as, as emotions. If we ask about attitudes, if we ask about goals, um, if we ask about decisions, we have the same kinds of issues where, where we have what people say, what they display to us, and we have what's going in uh, inside their minds, which is not so readily accessible to us, at least in interviews. In fact, at least with emotions, people have uh, accessed a lot of what goes inside, uh, on inside our, our minds, our brains, and our bodies. Uh, in a way that you can't do with a lot of the stuff we, we think about. Uh, in fact, like anything else, multiple methods are, I think, the way to get at emotions. Um, you ask people, uh, you observe people, uh, you get people to write down emotion diaries, and perhaps best of all, you go out and you participate in this, the actions yourselves so that you feel in all likelihood, the same things that they are feeling. And then you can use introspection to uh, figure out what's going on emotionally. Um, these, are not, uh, these are no harder than anything else we do as social scientists, it seems to me. And so uh, I, I think that's a, a bit of a straw target when people say, well, you know, I'd like to study emotions, but it's just too hard. Um, okay. So to sum up, um, emotions are a way to bring agency and structure together. Uh, this was a debate a long time ago, but it's still um, an ongoing dilemma in social science, how you, how you take a snapshot of structures at a given time, but how you also have agency and time and process going through those structures and, and changing them. Um, partly it's because uh, emotions are linked to decisions. They're linked to dilemmas, perceptions about the world. And in fact, structural constraints play a role in action because we anticipate those constraints. We anticipate, uh, we think about them, we try to figure out ways to get around the structures, to change the structures, to to violate the rules and so on. So structures, whatever their reality out there, have a reality inside, uh, inside of us. We have emotions about them. We have fears about the police. We have uh, anxieties about the other parts of the state and so on. So um, we, we, can, we can get at um, structure uh, through our emotions about structure to some extent. Um, one thing about structure <clears throat> and agency that I would say, there's a language that's often used of macro and micro and meso sometimes as well. And macro, it's the macro micro language sort of implies, well, these are just different levels of reality. You can look at the micro level, you can look at individuals and interactions among individuals, or you can look at the macro level. But this is a, a little misleading because the micro level is something you really can look at. The macro level, for the most part, is something you, you theorize, you posit. Uh, it's not something you can see. There, there is an ontological difference between the two. And with, uh, well, by bringing in emotions, you keep this at the level of individuals who are feeling things, who are thinking things, whom you can talk to. You can't talk to a country. Uh, you, you can only talk to individuals who claim to represent that country or who are officials in that country and so on. So um, I, I rather like actor network theory here for its insistence on very, small concrete things that you can see that are brought together to accomplish, uh, to accomplish action. All right. Um, one question is, you know, have we gotten back with emotions? Have we gotten back to uh, the 1950s, uh, the bad old days of crowd theorists uh, who thought that emotions were, were irrational? Are we bringing 
irrationality somehow back into into our uh, into our models and our is this a pejorative view, a, a dismissive view of protesters? And obviously, obviously, I think uh, no is the answer. Um, it's the whole question of rationality and the whole long tradition that dismissed emotions as irrational also dismissed certain categories of people as irrational. So since the ancient Greeks, at least, um, certain groups of people have been considered emotional rather than rational. So uh, in, in Greece, enslaved people, uh, women, non-citizens, uh, more recently, um, immigrants, um, the working class in the 19th century, these groups have been excluded from politics because they were emotional and irrational and not thinking beings. <clears throat> so for all sorts of political and analytic reasons, I think we have to reject that. So you can use emotions to rethink um, uh, actions that we come to regret later, let's call them that. So you do something in anger, you might well regret it later. This is not necessarily irrational. Uh, it might have felt very good at the time to uh, take a swing at the police officer there uh, right in front of you uh, or to, to taunt that person in some way, to make fun of them. Um, later, after it's been caught on camera, uh, you may come to regret it because uh, you look, uh, you look uh, crazy or you look uh, threatening. Um, you, you are not conveying the kind of reputation that you want. That's a regret because of a difference between the short run and the long run feelings that you have about that action. There's another way in which um, actions are often said to be irrational, which is if the first is a disjuncture between the short run and the long run, this is a disjuncture between what an individual wants and what a broader group wants. So I, as an individual, may be quite happy to have um, struck a police officer or done or thrown a brick through a plate glass window of a store. And I may continue to think that that was a gr the greatest moment of my life. However, the people in my group, the people in my movement may think otherwise, and they may find that my action was disruptive to their collective goals, their collective efforts to uh, make a statement, to remain peaceful and so on. So just like there can be a disjunct juncture between short run and long run, there can be a disjuncture between my personal um, desires and the larger group desires. So there are ways in which emotions can be part of mistaken or regrettable actions. People don't make mistakes because of emotions uh, any more uh, than they do because of mistaken information, because of mistaken calculations, because of mistaken choices taken at the most uh, you know, conscious aware, consciously aware level. So to somehow um, put emotions in the category with mistakes, much less irrationality, it seems to me is clearly wrong. Um, finally, I think that the study of emotions is part of a broader, what I would think of, what I would like to call a humane sociology or social science. And by this, I mean, uh, one of the things that I've always disliked about structural approaches and rational choice approaches is that, um, and, and it's, it's always men who have these theories, uh, believe me. Um, they think that they're smarter than the people they study. And so they might have this cynical view uh, that says, well, these people are pretending to be uh, doing this out of the goodness of their hearts, but really there are interests at work that they're lying about or they're fooling themselves about. Or with structures, uh, the structural version of that is to say, well, these protesters go out there and they think they're changing the world, but the only thing that will really change the world is 
changes in structures due to economic shifts and, and market shifts and, and demographic shifts and urbanization and, and such. Um, so there's this kind of um, um, smarter than thou uh, view out there in social science that has got, that guided the literature on social movements for a long time. And I, I think the way to get back to a more humane, a more respectful sociology is that we have to listen to people. We have to respect the people we study. Um, this is easy to do for movements that we're part of. It's harder to do with uh, right-wing movements that we really do uh, think are, are we, we want to think are crazy or disgusting uh, in various ways. We have to figure out ways to analyze them that don't simply say they're crazy, um, but also don't reduce them to material interests either, because that never works with social movements, whether it's the right or the left, it's never simply a calculation of material advantage. So we have to get inside people's heads. Um, the term lived experience is, is very popular now and, uh, and I like that. Um, but what is lived experience if not uh, emotions? Uh, how we feel about the world, how the world feels to us. Emotions are ongoing evaluations of how we're doing. Are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? Do we need to adjust here? Should we be proud of ourselves? Uh, should we uh, feel guilty? All of those kinds of things are how we engage the world, how we experience the world. And so it seems to me as we, as we try to build what I hope we're building, which is, as I say, a, a humane, respectful sociology, it seems to me that emotions in all of their uh, messy uh, glory uh, have to be central to that kind of, um, that kind of endeavor. Um, and it's not just respect, it's also realism. This is how people operate. They operate with a lot of messy emotions in, in their lives and in their actions. So it's, it's more realistic than the, the very simple models of rational choice theory or structural theory. But better yet, uh, emotions are what make life fun. It's uh, what make, makes life fun. They are, they are what make life fun to live as a human being. They are also what make life uh, fun to study, to write about as sociologists, uh, all the weird and wonderful and frightening things that uh, people feel in life and in politics. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I change. Okay. Sí, uh, ahora hablo en español. Uh, ha sido increíble cómo en una hora pudiste recorrer muchísima de tu propuesta teórica. Realmente uh, te felicito por la capacidad de síntesis y los ejemplos clarísimos. De hecho, el ejemplo sobre el meaning, el significado, por ejemplo, con el gato, yo creo que uh, ha sido uno de los ejemplos más claros vinculados con la cultura que, 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 que ha escuchado y uh, ayuda muchísimo o nos ayuda muchísimo a, a comprender en profundidad este vínculo entre cultura, emociones y acción. Hay algunas preguntas del público y algunas uh, nuestras también. Entonces, no sé si Tomaso quiere empezar con las preguntas del público. Hay, hay una pregunta sobre uh, los movimientos de víctimas en México, que no sabemos cuánto sabes, ¿no? Por ejemplo, padres de desaparecidos que buscan sus hijos en pozas clandestinas. Y nosotros hemos pensado que la pregunta podría ir más en general, si, digamos, para no entrar en el caso específico, sobre el papel del dolor. El dolor como emoción que puede paralizar, que puede movilizar, que está presente en distintos movimientos. O sea, no sé si tienes ganas de decir algo vinculado con esa emoción tan compleja como el dolor. Bueno, well, there are a couple of things. Those are two questions, pain and victims, um, I, I think. Um, uh, 
let's start with pain. Um, pain has a lot of roles and it's, it's actually a feeling, I, I didn't talk about this, um, although I do in the book, it's a, what I call um, uh, urges or strong feelings. They're very bodily um, uh, urges, well, feelings that we have. They're not quite usually called emotions so that, you know, it's just being tired or being hungry or um, lust, um, having to go to the bathroom uh, or being in pain. These are kinds of things that sort of crowd out all the rest of the world. Intense pain means you only want to get that pain to stop and you, you forget about everything else that you love in the world uh, in order to get that pain to stop. And that's the, the basis of, of torture and why it, uh, why it works you know, often. Um, uh, all your other goals, your priorities disappear. Um, it's also why religious groups uh, can use pain or you know, individuals, uh, say anorexics, cutters, can use pain to push away the rest of the world and totally focus on the body at the moment. So pain is, is definitely uh, a cluster of feeling, thinking processes that can be very important in, in politics. Okay, so... Victims, um, you have to be careful in politics in using victims or in being victims so that victims are weak. They're very sympathetic. They're very good. Pe people pity them. But victims tend to be so weak that they can't help themselves. The point of being a victim is demanding help from other people right? You want the state to help you. You want a social movement to help you. You want somebody to save you. So it's best to, there's a dilemma here, right? Um, you don't want to present yourself as a victim in some essential way that you are a victim. You've been a victim. You are a victim. You're always going to be a victim because while it gets sympathy and help, it also excludes you from being a real political player, a full citizen. So what movements typically do is the, the strongest movements or the most successful is some people are the victims and other people speak on behalf of those victims. So with people who've been killed, obviously they are no longer around to speak for themselves. And so their families and friends can speak for them. Um, it's a, so that's a strong, you know, a strong kind of movement. We've seen movements like that very often, uh, sadly, throughout Latin America in recent decades. Um, it's a little different if you yourself were the victim so that um, Nancy Whittier, great scholar of social movements, has written about the, the movement to, um, of survivors of child abuse, especially child sexual abuse. So they work hard to say, um, we were abused when we were young. We were total victims because we were children. What we've done since then is become survivors. We've become strong. We're, we're heroes of endurance is a, is a phrase that I use. So we've, we've put that aside and we're now strong enough to help people who are uh, the children who are now being abused. We're no longer in that status, but we need to stop that abuse. So again, it's, it's a, a way of ha having it both ways. There are, there are victims, but there are also heroes to protect them. Um, what Nancy writes about is these interesting dynamics when these survivors go on TV shows to talk about their experiences. The TV shows being you know, kind of creepy talk shows want these people to kind of show their pain, revert to their childhoods and talk about how, how terrible it was. So they will give them teddy bears to hold. They will bring in um, therapists and experts who become, who become the heroes and talk about their ex these other people's experiences as children. And so they want them to kind of regress, revert to being victims right in front of their TV audiences. 
Uh, some, sometimes the, the people are willing to do that because of the power of getting the, the image out there, but the power of the sympathy they can get. Other times they really don't like uh, doing that. They want to be the, the heroes and show that they've survived and flourished. So there are a lot of dilemmas around victimhood. There are dilemmas also after civil wars, when there's been some sort of massacre, some sort of genocide perhaps, uh, how do you do that balancing act between the pity you want for a group of people who you know, may be a very large number of the population, maybe the majority of the population? How do you balance uh, the pity for them as victims with the respect you want to give them now that uh, they're full citizens or trying to become full citizens? Quería hacerte una pregunta. Um pensando un poco en el trabajo de algunas dificultades que tenemos con los estudiantes. En tu libro eh, hablas muy específicamente en The Emotion of Protest, hablas de emociones negativas y positivas. Eh, nosotros hemos intentado pensar sobre esta propuesta y hemos intentado superarlo con algunos estudiantes en cuanto eh, vemos esta definición vinculada todavía mucho a la psicología de emociones positivas y negativas. Es decir, eh, vemos que algunas emociones, como por ejemplo el duelo del movimiento por víctimas, son por la psicología definida como emociones negativas, pero en el caso de los movimientos sociales, algunas emociones son movilizadoras. Igual el dolor, el duelo. Por lo tanto, en lugar de hablar de emociones positivas y negativas, nosotros hemos empezado a hablar de emociones deseadas y no deseadas por parte de los movimientos sociales. Es decir, el duelo es una emoción no deseada, claramente, pero en algunos casos es movilizadora. ¿Qué piensas de, 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 de superar este binomio positivo y negativo en las, de las emociones? Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting, yeah. Um, it is a kind of blunt uh, dichotomy. And so it's a little suspect, I would say, for, for that reason. And, um, and some emotions, we even, we even uh, pursue what would normally be think, thought of as negative emotions sometimes. As I said before, you know, we might put on a music, a uh, piece of music that makes us sad. But it's, you know, it's a little sad, you know, we're sort of experiencing it like, you know, like we were reading about somebody in a novel and they have a sad life or, or they're afraid. We watch a horror movie so to experience the emotion a little. So there's that kind of almost aesthetic experience of a, of a negative emotion that we do crave. Um, what I've talked about, as you know, is, is the combinations of emotions and especially the combinations of negative and positive emotions because, and, and they're important uh, because negative emotions get our attention, right? They we're shocked by fear or anger or disgust. Uh, we pay attention to them because um, we're not used to them. We're more, uh, there's more at risk for us in our, in our, world with a negative emotion really than with a positive emotion. So I think we need those negative emotions, as you say, um, they're important for mobilizing. If there weren't negative emotions, uh, people wouldn't get out into the streets to protest. But there usually has to be some positive side as well, some positive emotion, which might just be the pleasure of protesting. Um, One of, that's one of the things about paying attention to emotions. You realize people who go and protest don't always think that they're going to win. And they certainly don't think they're going to get everything. Um, but it feels good just to voice your disapproval, to protest, to join with a group of people who feel the same way that you do. And you might hope 
that there's some chance that you would succeed, but it's not necessary. And in the old, in the old uh, theories, the, the structural theories, if you go back and you look at somebody like Doug McAdam, who writes about cognitive liberation, what the key to him was, the cultural aspect was, people had to suddenly think that they could win and that repression was not so great and they might be able to, to do something. Well, uh, yes, that's certainly a, a part of, of protest or can be a part and it. It's a good thing for protest, but it's not necessary and it's not the key. Um, there are a whole lot of feelings that go with protest and uh, expressing anger. I mean, anger is normally th thought of as a negative emotion, but that shows how arbitrary positive and negative really are, as you're po pointing out, I think, right? It can feel good to go out and shout and express your anger with other people. So um, it depends on the setting, perhaps. Uh, if you express anger with a group that feels empowering, it becomes outrage and indignation. If you experience anger at home, sitting in front of the TV, that might go along with a feeling of, of disempowerment, frustration. Uh, and, and so there are always combinations of emotions. And that's why it's, I think, hard to say, um, you know, it, this emotion is just negative and this emotion is just positive because they come in combinations. Even positive emotions can come mixed with some negative emotions. So I can feel a joy at some triumph uh, or joy at, um, at, at, a, at a rally, but I also know it might be our last rally and the movement is falling apart. And so th th this is one way in which emotions are, are hard to study because they come in, in combinations this way. And, and that's why participation is such a, a good way to sort them out because um, it's, it's hard to, you can never just say about a movement or protest, oh, that's a movement uh, based on anger or that's a movement based on joy. Um, you know, the movements are compli very complicated things with lots of emotions going on. And uh, as you say, you also have the emotion you're feeling now versus emotions that you anticipate feeling in the future, depending on what you do. So it could be that the negative feeling you have now leads you to anticipate a better feeling if you go out to a protest and go out to a march and, and express that anger with other people. So uh, it is complex. Gracias. Gracias, Jim. Tus respuestas son muy reflexivas. Nos ayudan a pensar sobre lo que, lo que estamos, ¿no? Uh, aplicando las emociones y cómo lo estamos haciendo, lo que estamos observando también en, en distintos países, ¿no? Sobre la aplicación de, uh, de la dimensión emocional. De hecho, hay saludos desde Colombia, Argentina, uh, México, entonces uh, hay muchas personas de muchos países que nos están siguiendo. Y una pregunta que surgió a partir de la comparación entre Black Lives Matter, el Climate Movement, el movimiento climático, es si de alguna manera las emociones que se observan en un movimiento pueden darnos pistas sobre las características y dinámicas de este movimiento. ¿no? Y yo añado además, si has observado algún movimiento que ha empezado a uh, expresar o emplear las emociones de distinta manera como se hacía hace unos años, ¿no? Si has observado algún cambio en estas décadas en la manera de expresar, ya que las emociones han sido eh, vinculadas con la racionalidad por mucho tiempo, hay activistas que no querían expresar su, las, sus emociones para no perjudicar la lucha. Y lo que nosotros hemos observado que en los últimos años los activistas expresan con más libertad sus emociones, la han transformado en una herramienta de lucha. Pero no, no en todos los movimientos, no siempre. Entonces queremos conocer tu visión sobre esta dinámica de cómo expresan los movimientos sus emociones y si además 
las emociones pueden identificarnos movimiento con características diferentes. That's a lot of questions. Um, one thing, I, I do think that there are shifts over long periods of time. Uh, and then Charles Tilley was actually quite good on, on this. What he described was shifts in arenas uh, from certain kinds of arenas that were more outdoors arenas to the rise of national parliaments and debates and so on. And so depending on what arena you're operating in, you may adopt a different emotional tone. So um, in the animal rights movement that I, I studied many years ago, um, there were street protests that emphasized uh, photos of the suffering of animals. Uh, the, so it's very easy to make animals into victims because you're not worried about empowering animals politically. So they could be pure objects of compassion. And so they could be quite emotional. But when you, um, when you have scientists debating uh, the use of different kinds of tests uh, and regulations when they go to hearings, public hearings, uh, you know, of course, then the movement uh, switched from, you know, it was mostly women, I would say 70 or 80% uh, female, uh, switched to, oh, here, let's trot out these men and send them off because they sound calmer and we associate masculinity with um, uh, non-emotionality, um, a lack of emotion. And so they, get, can, they would just give these scientific facts as though, as though they were neutral without emotion. So you, but of course this non-emotionality, this you know, emotional neutrality is itself an emotional accomplishment. We have to work hard at that, we, we practice that we figure out the things to say and not say to bring that about. So there's nothing, uh, there's nothing natural about being unemotional, it seems to me. But so, so that's part of it. Part of it is a shift of arenas. Part of it, there are tastes in tactics that have, have shifted. Um, I think in the 1960s and early 70s, the more violent movements, uh, certainly in, uh, in the US, um, and to some extent elsewhere, they were sort of discredited for a while. And so in the 1970s, uh, feminists and other of the so-called new social movements uh, that, that uh, Melucci talks about uh, post 68, they were, they were softer movements. They um, were extremely nonviolent. Uh, they uh, had extensive nonviolent training when they would do protests. Um, they, were, they were scared of violence. They were scared of the kinds of people who become leaders when movements espouse violence. And so for a long time, the, I think the trend in social movements was toward nonviolence. Now that shifted a little um, with a lot of the global justice uh, protests, um, the G8 protests where the police became more violent. And so protesters uh, became a little more um, aggressive. Again, violent isn't quite the right word because mostly they were breaking windows and things. They weren't attacking police very often. They were being attacked by police. Um, so these tastes and tactics can certainly shift over time and bring with them uh, approve, emotional approval or disapproval of different uh, kinds of tactics. But it's hard to say, you know, other than uh, the, the pacifist movement or the nonviolent movement, if there is such a thing, very few movements um, are explicitly about the emotions that they have toward tactics. Uh, most try to leave open some tactical flexibility. Uh, it's a bit of an illusion because everybody has the favorite things that they want to do. And they tend to stick with those things, whether they are working too well 
or not, but that's, that's because of the emotional attachments they have to different kinds of actions, as well as the expertise they develop and the resources they develop around different tactics as well. But certainly part of it is, is emotional. Um, you know, to get more, try to be more specific, um, the, uh, the climate change movement, it seems to me, has, has certainly grown, um, but there's often frustration, I think precisely because um, everybody knows it should be even much bigger than it is, given the nature, the scope of the, the problem. Um, and it's, it's, I think it has to do with the, how hard it is to really pinpoint um, or connect the victims and the villains to bring them together in ways that uh, make it clear to people uh, what the direct costs are because the costs are fairly indirect. So it requires an abstract level of abstraction to connect them. It's sort of like, um, sort of like criticizing capitalism. Uh, capitalism is a big, broad, complicated system. Uh, we know that bad things happen as a result of world, the world system, but it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to draw the link. Sometimes it's easy and we can get uh, very clear victims and very clear villains. Uh, that has happened in a lot of Latin America, for example. But um, for the most part, the bigger the system, the more abstract it is, the harder it is to make a clear link. So it's always, uh, it's easier. You might want to abstract ideology, but in terms of building the right public characters and getting the emotions of indignation that you need, you need very specific uh, images. You need very specific people, I think, to, to blame and to pity. If that, if that uh, doesn't answer all of your questions, but some. Muchas gracias, sí, contestaste las preguntas. Y además, uh, y además, en realidad queremos que este sea un principio de conversación. Entonces no queremos tampoco concluir todos los argumentos. Pero lo que acababas de decir del movimiento climático es justo lo que estaba pensando cuando en tu presentación hiciste el ejemplo de um, la culpa, ¿no? de culpar a los responsables. Y justo estaba pensando en lo mismo, ¿no? En la dificultad de culpar un sistema, eh, el sistema capitalista. Y lo que ha pasado también es eh, que la misma narrativa mainstream de cambio climático, lo que ha hecho en, los en las últimas décadas es cul culpar los individuos, la gente del cambio climático y de la contaminación. Entonces, en el movimiento climático tienen, es, hay una, digamos, identidad en construcción, no hay una identidad colectiva consolidada como en otros movimientos sociales, y en esta construcción de identidad entre, digamos, las eh, corrientes más eh, radicales ¿no? de justicia climática y las eh, ambientalistas, digamos, por, por las energías limpias, por ejemplo, ¿no? Ahí vemos que hay una dificultad en eh, crear esa narrativa de culpa colectiva, pero no colectiva del ser humano, porque lo que está pasando es que hay toda una narrativa del ser humano como especie que, eh, digamos, destruye la naturaleza. Entonces, esta, digamos, dificultad entre lo individual y lo colectivo en el, la, el proceso de construcción de la culpa es algo muy complejo. Entonces, no sé si tienes alguna reflexión alrededor de esto, ¿no? de cómo se puede superar eh, esa culpa al individuo, al, al ciudadano que no cierra el grifo en cinco minutos cuando se ducha, comparado con la destrucción del medio ambiente y la emergencia climática. Yeah, um, it does remind me a little bit about of, of Marx's critique of capitalism. And um, 
he had, of course, this great scientific veneer with all these predictions, very interesting predictions about the future of capitalism, but it really depended on capitalism uh, either collapsing on its own or it depended on the emotions um, of outrage and anger against Mr. Moneybags and the other greedy capitalists who were destroying things. And it wasn't, it wasn't really, it didn't depend when it came to political action on all of the scientific analysis. It depended on arousing anger and outrage and indignation against uh, you know, capitalists are great and corporations now, multinational corporations are a great target. It's very easy to hate them, to fear them. Um, they are uh, maybe a little impersonal, but you can always find the corporate headquarters or the CEO. You can find people who've done outrageous things to hate uh, in corporations. And, and you know, the, the factory owners of Marx's day were a little bit like that. You've got to find a villain to, to make the whole critique work or to make a movement around uh, against capitalism or against climate. I, I think it's, I think we see by now that guilt is probably not the best uh, kind of emotion to use in building a movement. Uh, we all feel guilty. I think about, um, about our carbon impact. Uh, we should, if we don't, um, you know, and I think about this a lot with uh, plastic recycling. I've been a very enthusiastic recycler for a very long time. And uh, uh, well, I, I, will, I will have to say plastic recycling in most countries is a fraud. Uh, it's not very successful. Uh, now I recycle the ones and the twos, but not the other numbers. And I still try to, it's fair, it's, it's, been very disappointing. Um, it's, it's really hard. I think um, the best thing, look, climate change, the best thing anybody can do for the climate is not have kids. But you read again and again, books by climate change experts about, you know, what it dire situation this is, urgency. And then in the preface, uh, they talk about, oh, my daughter was born while I was working on this book and I hope that she and her generation will come up with solutions and so on. And you realize, wow, not having kids is a pretty tough thing to ask of people. Uh, it's one of the greatest human satisfactions, potential satisfactions. Uh, how do you ask somebody not to have kids? Uh, but, you know, in the shadow of that, yeah, taking planes, not recycling plastics, it's trivial, right? So uh, luckily, fertility rates are falling anyway, for other reasons. Um, here's a kind of time when a social movement could take advantage of trends, structural trends, we could even call them demographic trends, and try to accelerate them, uh, make them move a little faster. But um, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to ask people to do that kind, make that kind, make that not that kind of sacrifice because it's unique, to, but to make that sacrifice. Um, but how do you do that? Uh, maybe I don't think you do it by making them feel guilty. I don't think you do it by uh, targeting large families and making them into the villains. You could go after the Mormons who, who have this crazy belief that the more kids you have, the better you'll get them out of purgatory. Um, it's hard to figure out who you demonize with climate change in, in general, I think. And um, I, I don't have any good solutions um, for that. Uh, you know, we're fucked. You know, but, you know, even that resignation, you can't really just live with that. You've got to, you've got to keep trying, um, you know, you've, but it's, it's, you've, you've got to figure out how to make those links, how to find those good symbols of villains and victims together. Thank you very much. I think no one has, has solutions, but we have to build them. Yeah. Tom, I have a, a, another question. Sí, Jim, eh, en todos tus escritos y estudios siempre has destacado el, el papel del movimiento feminista 
como uno de los movimientos que más ha impulsado la, el proceso de reapropiación ¿no? de, de las emociones, que ha permitido un, un proceso, un emotion work de determinadas emociones como de vergüenza, orgullo, vergüenza, rabia, etcétera, etcétera. Bien, eh, en, en ese último años en América Latina, estamos teniendo una, una importante ola de movimiento feminista. Un movimiento feminista que se destaca, por lo menos en América Latina, desde sus anteriores, por tener una, un carácter más radical. Quería preguntarte si tú, desde tu experiencia, ve una diferencia en, uh, en, en expresar emociones y también en qué emociones caracteriza el movimiento desde el movimiento de Estados Unidos que tú mirabas, feminista, y, y la ola latinoamericana. Si hay puntos de contactos o hay algunas diferencias importantes que quiere, que, ah, quiere destacar. Uh, let me say I, uh, right up front, I don't know. Um, I think I would say that alongside the feminist movement uh, have been the LGBTQ movements, which have also sort of helped this kind of, I, I, I think of it really as a queer revolution in social movement studies. Um, uh, really in the 1990s, I would say, uh, in the, in the kind of shadow of ACT UP, large numbers of people who had been scholar or had been activists in ACT UP and queer rights um, went into, went off to graduate school as, as so often happens and started writing about, um, at the time, lesbian and gay rights and now LGBTQ rights. Um, and I think what they brought was a very strong sense of the of collective identity, even though in the U.S. in some ways identity politics began with the black nationalists in the '60s, it entered the academy and certainly social movement studies in the 1990s with just an extraordinary string of um, people like Verda Taylor, or her students like Nancy Whittier, who I mentioned. Uh, but also people like Olivier Filiul in the, in the France and now Switzerland. Um, a lot of get, lay, get, gay and lesbian folks who um, have done great, so have really pushed the boundary of how we understand social movements away from uh, these uh, structural uh, uh, theories. And, you know, if it's, I don't want to be Freudian about it, um, but um, the men who promoted the, the structural theories, you know, we talk about the hard uh, methods that they use and the hard theories. And uh, I'll, I'll just a, a, an aside, Chuck Tilley, who was sort of the center of this and a, a brilliant man, of course, was also a very short guy. And he was one of the most competitive people. Uh, he had what I think of as a Cicero complex. Cicero was a short guy and could never resist jokes about other men, uh, putting them down in, in a way. Tilly, Tilly was very much like this. He had a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he was kind of combative. And I think Uh, you know, that's a big part of what uh, explains social movement theory in the late 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, Taro, uh, McAdam are a little bit the same way. So there was just a softening, I think, of, uh, of work in social movements, um, a, a, a joy in humanity, a, um, um, a niceness. Uh, to, to put it bluntly, that, that came about. Um, that's in the, the academy. In social movements, I think there was something of the same thing. Um, I think the feminist movement had a harder time of it, uh, but the, by the time LGBTQ movements emerged, it really came into their own 20 years ago, you know, as, as we went from gay and lesbian to LGBTQ, um, they had a big impact 
on a lot of movements, including in the US, the labor movement. Um, they were in a way the founders of Black Lives Matter. So there was much more attention to full diversity, to internal process, internal democracy, to uh, making sure uh, everybody had a voice at the table, all of these kinds of things that the hard left eh, didn't really have time for. So I think, you know, sort of the hard left and the soft left, um, uh, you know, the, or the, the old left, you know, Turin would have made the same distinction between the old left and the new left a uh, long time ago. Um, it's about respect. It's about um, tolerance of others and, and diversity. It's about, uh, it's a caring perspective. Now, it's hard to go from this very nice nurturing perspective to a, an aggressive set of tactics and, and out in the world. But, uh, you know, anger can help you do that, right? And again, you know, if you're indignant enough about the suffering of a certain group, that will empower you to go out and demand, you know, and very strongly make demands out in the world on their behalf. So I think that has been the shift. Um, you know, the feminist movement today, to get back to your real question, I, I'm not sure where exactly it is, except it has gotten into these other movements like Black Lives Matter. And uh, it seems to me the issues in Latin America are a little different with uh, abortion rights, uh, although <laughs> not so different anymore in the US. Um, but I don't, as for the emotional emotions in them, I, I couldn't really say emotional differences. Sí. Y ya concluimos con la última pregunta o digamos, te pedimos una reflexión a partir de uh, una pregunta del público vinculada con uh, las estrategias de autocuidado que se han desarrollado enormemente en los últimos dos años en este contexto de pandemia y también de emergencia climática, que por supuesto la tenemos encima y no se va con la pandemia. ¿no? Entonces, el autocuidado ya existía en el movimiento feminista, por ejemplo, eh, que tiene una, una larga, eh, digamos, tradición. Pero... Eh, ¿Crees que también esas nuevas estrategias de autocuidado en este contexto de crisis, digamos, general, eh, sanitaria, ambiental, eh, tiene que ver también con uh, ese, en el giro cultural? Es decir, nuevas emociones que se convierten en regla del sentir, ¿no? Nue nueva atención a, eh, la te, a respeto a los demás, esta amabilidad, niceness, como tú decías, hacia las otras personas. Nosotros creemos que sí está cambiando algo, aunque estamos en el principio y seguramente tiene que ver con el contexto. ¿Tú cómo lo ves de esas estrategias de autocuidado y las emociones que los acompañan? That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, let, let me take a broad historical, long historical view. Um, and I think in some ways, the, the, there was a women's tradition of self-care in the past, uh, before the 1960s, that uh, really, um, because they were outside the public sphere more than inside it they were there because of their privatization that self self care tradition was often a kind of narcissistic tradition uh you know it was women's role to go shopping uh to to be taken care of by others and so in the 20th century as women became You know, more serious economic players and political players, the, the time was ripe for self-care to, to, to well, kind of be put aside in favor of the public sphere for a while. Um, but remember Foucault wrote about the care of the self and you know, before he died in the, the mid 80s. 
Um, he meant something a little different, but it was a natural response to his view of politics as diffracted, as local. Um, your, your care of the self became political. But again, it was partly his view as a gay man who um, had, was, had, had this softer view of the world, uh, despite uh, you know, a kind of uh, fierce intellectual uh, approach. He, uh, I gather, was actually a, you know, a, a very decent person who tried very hard to bring care of the self in with very political public politics. So I would say that there is a strand in the, again, the gay community that alongside feminism um, has reworked gender in a way that um, it has to do with the care of self respect for others. Um, Donald J. Trump uh, was a bit of a setback for this view to say the least. Um, I think he empowered a more traditional view of let's call, let's say of men as assholes, um, of aggressive, nasty, uncaring about others, competitive and so on. Um, so you, at least in this country, you can see, well, a third of the population roughly has that view of how you treat other people. A third maybe has uh, the more care of the self uh, and care of others view, the more caring view, a third, you know, somewhere in between. So in a way, maybe Trump helped to draw the battle lines more clearly uh, so that part of reacting against Donald Trump was to be decent to other people and to say that that matters in politics. Um, you know, to, as long as I'm on the topic, uh, people talk a lot about, uh, you know, is there going to be another civil war here in the United States? And uh, some of the rhetoric is overdrawn, um, but some of, it, uh, some of it is not. And, and there's an inequality. Uh, you know, I've always said the right wing is always better armed than the left. Uh, they have more ammunition. They have more guns. They believe in violence in a way that people on the left do. So it's hard to talk between those two extremes, the more, the more nurturing end of things and the more uh, violent end of things. As, and we're seeing that now. There's not much. The people in the middle just disappear. Um, I think the people who believe in process, who believe in respect for others, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a small number of people in uh, law schools and international organiz aid organizations and a few academics. And for the most part, uh, people um, have more substantive views and they are not proceduralists, if, uh, if that's the word uh, you can get across. So, yeah, I think the pandemic has helped, but the pandemic, it's been a very privatized caring uh, for the self and through networks like this, through Zoom. And we need to get that back out into affinity groups and protest groups again and take advantage of that. But, you know, these things, uh, the pendulum swings back and forth. And so I think that will be possible in coming years. Uh, but uh, it's going to be hard when you've got places like the United States where vaccinations themselves and science itself has become a, a source of contention, whether to believe it or not. So uh, it, uh, it, it's hard to get much, to get very far that way, I would say. Sí, sobre el autocuidado, nosotros lo hemos observado sobre todo en los grupos de base grassroots movements que dieron solidaridad y apoyo a los más vulnerables y también mucho autocuidado dentro de los colectivos, ¿no? Ayudándose cuando se infectaban, ayudando a las familias en dificultad, entonces, a un nivel micro y de, de base. Eso sí lo hemos observado. 
Yeah, interesting. That also um, ties back into ACT UP. That's what the gay communities were doing in the face of AIDS. And they really, uh, especially, I would say, the gay men and the lesbians, uh, you know, who had really had very different movements before the AIDS epidemic, uh, came together and worked together in ACT UP. And uh, all the credit for that really goes to the lesbian activists. Uh, lesbians were not at risk of getting AIDS themselves but they took this on as a project of solidarity with the, with the gay men who were getting sick and dying. And it's, it, was a, it was a real act of heroism, I would say. And it, it, uh, even though the, the initial reaction in a lot of places to um, the, the, the AIDS epidemic was, was to stigmatize and blame gay men themselves, uh, the long run um, effect was community solidarity and a, a real admiration, I think, from outside the community as well, that as they took, took care of uh, people, took care of their own, but also took care of people who weren't quite their own, again, with the example of lesbians. So um, uh, there could well be a very good parallel here, yeah. not with today. Muchas gracias. Y con, y con eso terminamos, porque ya te pedimos, te hicimos muchas preguntas, hablaste muchísimo, nos enriqueciste. Y eh, ahora dejo a Tomaso las últimas palabras de, de despedida y luego también, Jim, si quieres saludar y despedirte, eh, la pantalla es tuya. Tomaso. Sí. Muchas gracias, Jim, para abrir ese seminario sobre emoción y activismo de base, que es el primero que se hace en, uh, en lengua española. Eh, es un tema muy importante, ya que recordamos que otro seminario importante se realizó eh, hace 20 años, antes del libro Personal Politics que tú organizaste. Así, eh, después de 20 años, en, en español intentamos hacer una este seminario sobre emociones y activismo de base. Yo recuerdo al público que la próxima sesión es el 3 de marzo y hablaremos del de, eh, papel de las emociones en el activismo feminista. Tendremos dos, uh, otros dos colegas que nos presentarán uh, uh, digamos, sus investigaciones del papel de las emociones en el activismo feminista. Con esto yo cierro. Doy las gracias a Sage al Instituto para el Apoyo, a Paola Salina, al intérprete que claramente ha tenido un esfuerzo importante eh, para la traducción, y dejo la última palabra a, la, a Jimmy para saludar el público eh, hispanohablante. Wonderful. Well, thank you all today. Uh, and uh, Paola, thank you for doing a great job of translating uh, and keeping up with me. Uh, throughout for all these two hours. So I very much appreciate it. It's not an easy job. Uh, good luck with the rest of the seminar, Elice and Tom, and uh, keep me in, in touch and informed and other questions that come up. You know, we'll continue our longstanding uh, email correspondence, uh, especially this semester. So good luck with everything. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jimmy.